This is the Physical Activity Researcher Podcast, a podcast for researchers of sedentary behavior, physical activity, and sports. Join for a relaxed dialogue about research design, practicalities, and, well, anything related to research. Learn from your fellow researchers useful and relevant information that does not fit into formal content and limited space of scientific publications. And here is your host, researcher and entrepreneur, Oli Tikkanen. Welcome, everyone. I'm honored to have a guest today, Stuart Cray from University of Glasgow, senior lecturer, and he's interested about sarcopenia and associated metabolic disorders. Welcome, Stuart. Thank you very much, and it's good to speak to you today. Yeah, it's great. So, uh, how did you become a researcher? Well, it wasn't necessarily a, a plan that I had. I, I just kind of stumbled into it almost. I came back to school, I was always interested in sport and interested in science. And at the point uh, where I had to decide what university degree to study, one of my teachers said, Oh, they've got new degrees called sports science. Why don't you study one of them? You like sport and science, I said. That sounds like a good idea. So off I went. They studied, yeah. studied. It was called physiology and sports science at, at the time. Really enjoyed university life. The lecture side of things and the classes were okay, but in the final year when they kind of get into the project side of things where you could really take ownership of a study in the lab and you were generating new data that nobody had ever answering a question nobody had ever answered before I found that really interesting I found that really exciting to to kind of to, to do it kind of was a, a level up from the listening to somebody talk about something interesting this was a it was new data I had to understand it what did it all mean and I found that fascinating so after that I did work for a little bit of time in a gym and but I always kind of in the back of my head had I'd quite like to keep that research side of things going so eventually found a PhD that was open and accepted me which was a was was the, was the first problem and and then just kind of kept going from there and once I started the PhD the the research bug was kind of had got me so I was kind of on that path and not likely to to move from it really hmm yeah and, and now you main research interest in in sarcopenia how did you start studying that and what's the most interesting thing in sarcopenia yeah so my phd was actually not in anything to do with sarcopenia so my phd was looking at how if we changed muscle temperature how that could affect muscle performance muscle metabolism so it was very much focused on kind of young healthy people uh, mm. After that, I started some kind of postdoc research looking at inflammatory cytokines and their role in metabolism during exercise and starting to verge a little bit into health. I also was involved in a kind of long term uh, intervention trial as a postdoc looking at whether walking interventions could be useful for health. So I started to verge towards health a little bit. But being honest, the uh, there was probably two main reasons why I switched more from exercise performance type research to health and one was when I started an academic position I quickly realized that to be get anywhere in a UK university you need to acquire funding and sports performance is not a big big thing on the funders agenda whereas at that time and still now aging was a big thing we're living in an aging population uh, in the UK and in the Western world in general. There's a lot more older people, so there's a lot more aging research. Uh, and secondly, I just I I found it fascinating that, and and probably more useful from a societal point of view that some of the knowledge that we've kind of I studied during my undergraduate that was more focused in sports performance and maybe increasing muscle mass for exercise performance and athletic performance actually a lot of these mm. a lot of these things could potentially be applied in a population like older people or people with diabetes and the benefits that they could have from these things for me far outweighed the benefits that helping some athletes to kind of improve their performance uh, would be so that, that was the kind of 
two reasons why I kind of started to move towards aging. And the, the muscle loss with aging from a sports science physiology point of view was always the uh, was a kind of semi obvious place to to kind of to, to start really. Yeah, I think that's quite a common pattern with researchers that you're interested about sports yeah. and then you kind of the funding and then in the end you might be actually more interested about because it makes a bigger difference yeah. in the world and also that it, it is quite often a continuum from the athletes that try to gain muscle mass to actually people who try not to not to, to lose, to lose the muscle it, exactly, mass. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And I, yeah. st I still do have interest in the sports performance side of things and I teach in the MSc here in Sport and Exercise Science and Medicine and a lot of our students are always interested in that. So I do still run projects in that side of things but probably my main interest does definitely lie in the sarcopenia metabolic health side of things. Mm, all right. So what's what's the newest thing in sarcopenia research? What's, what's, what's new things there? Oh, what's new? That's a... That's a tricky question to to answer. Uh, I'm not even sure how to start with that one. What is new? What is new is that we still don't really understand why it happens. Would be pro would probably be uh, would be the would be the main thing that yeah we've known for many years now that muscles lost during aging that we have sarcopenia, but we've got a bit of an idea about what interventions are starting to work, but we still, mm. we still don't know why uh, why we lose muscle and how best to to actually stop people losing muscle and to gain it uh, in a way that people will actually do. So yeah, I'm not I'm not really sure I've answered the question there. I've kind of skirted around it a little bit because there's probably not one new thing, uh, but I'd say because it is still a, a kind of discipline that's in its infancy that there's. Probably what's more interesting for me is what we don't know, and there's still a lot that we don't know, uh, and these fundamental questions remain to be answered. Mm, yeah. So, so what kind of studies you are running at the moment related? So, from a sarcopenia point of view, the, the kind of main area that I've got stuff on the go. There's, there's two main areas. One is looking at nutritional interventions in sarcopenia, mm. and so I did some previous work looking at omega-3 fatty acids, so commonly found in fish oil uh, and fatty fish. I've had an interest in that for a wee while, and that kind of stemmed from two areas. One, there's some epidemiological data from kind of early, mid-2000s that published showing that of all the nutritional components that were measured in the diet, fatty fish intake was most strongly associated with grip strength so kind of that's obviously cross-sectional data from a kind of big epidemiological study so whether that's cause or effect we don't know but it indicates that maybe something in fatty fish could be useful for muscle then when i was in aberdeen i was working with some colleagues who actually worked more in animal nutrition so yeah. they they were looking at nutritional interventions to basically increase meat yield from animal and farming and they'd done some early work in uh, pigs and kind of calves uh, where if they gave people gave people if they gave the animals more omega-3 fatty acids in their diet they were seeing increases in protein metabolism increases in uh, and some increases in lean tissue so we started mm. uh, I started a kind of animal study with them in rats so we were looking at kind of aging rats giving them omega-3 fatty acids and we found that there was some metabolic benefits but also that there was a, a tendency for muscle to be preserved so they weren't losing muscle as as much as kind of control chow fed animals so that but again that's animal stuff that's not really where my main interest lies mostly i'm interested in kind of human physiology and what happens mm. what happens in people because we know that animal research doesn't always translate directly into into what happens in humans so managed to get some funding after some pilot work and uh, we did some stuff in cell culture as well that supported it showing that 
EPA and DHA, the kind of two omega-3 fatty acids in fish oil, had anabolic properties in skeletal muscle cells in a petri dish. We then got some funding to run a trial looking at uh, giving people fish oil, older people fish oil, whilst also performing resistance exercise. Because we know resistance exercise is the main anabolic, anabolic stimuli for uh, for older muscle. And mm. we found that in older men, the omega-3 fatty acids didn't seem to do an awful lot. Whereas in older women, we found that giving them omega-3 fatty acids during exercise training resulted in a greater improvement in muscle strength. Not muscle mass, but muscle strength. Mm -hmm. Because uh, we'd also taken some biopsies, we'd looked at muscle protein synthesis and these kind of things, and we didn't find anything different uh, in there mm -hmm. at all. So uh, that was quite interesting. One, that we've got a beneficial effect. Two, it wasn't through the mechanisms we thought. We thought it would be through a kind of anabolic mechanism, increasing muscle mass, that would drive the increase in strength. And we measured muscle mass by MRI, so it was kind of gold standard mm -hmm. measurements, but we found no change uh, so that was kind of indicating that possibly there's maybe a maybe it's a neuromuscular effect rather than necessarily a muscle mass effect at the same time as that there was a group in the states they did some studies in older people without exercise and interestingly they found that giving omega-3 fatty acids increased both muscle mass and muscle strength in older people not mm. exercising they didn't have the numbers to split by gender so it just was the overall population uh, of mixed men and women. So currently what we are doing is we're trying to, we're doing a study on that area and that area looking at giving omega-3 fatty acids. Instead of fish oil, we're using krill oil supplements this time because yeah. there's environmental reasons through uh, for using krill rather than fish oil. But also you can generally because of the higher concentration of, not the higher concentration, because of the higher bio bioavailability of the EP and DHA in the capsule, you can get more into the tissue without needing to take as much. Uh, so it's easier for all the people to kind of take the pills, take the capsules. So we're doing a, what we're doing in that study is we're doing a six month trial where we're giving mm. people the krill oil or not, so it's a randomized controlled trial. We're looking at muscle mass, muscle strength before and after, but we're also doing some, we're taking some EMG measurements, we're looking at, we're doing some muscle stimulations as well to try and start to tease out the mechanistic side of things as well, actually, what what is going on that's actually driving the effects of uh, omega-3 fatty acids on muscle. And the other studies I mentioned both had about 20, 30 people in them. They were relatively small. This study, we are trying to get... 120 people into the study and I think so far we've managed to get about 90 into the study so we should hopefully be able to provide more information firstly actually in a bigger cohort do the omega 3 still have the effect to can we kind of try and tease out the mechanistic side of things so that's kind of one area that I'm interested in doing quite a lot of uh, research the second area is that I mentioned there that resistance exercise is the kind of main thing that people, older people can do to gain, mm. mu gain muscle. We know it's not as effective in young people. We have this kind of anabolic resistance, but we know it's effective. Uh, so we're also trying to do some research more around, okay, we know it's effective, but how do we get people to do it? Mm. And that's the, that's the age old question. So. Yes, if I get people into the lab and I or one of my team supervise them, watch them do the exercise, make sure they're lifting the weights, everything goes well. That's not, you can't expect the older population to all have personal trainers through their whole life that make them do the exercise. That's not going to happen. So we're trying to develop some resistance exercise type exercise that people can do at home and actually... Mm -hmm can we still see the same benefits of unsupervised home-based exercise that doesn't need a lot of equipment because again older people not not just older people lots of people don't like gyms 
the thought of mm. going and going and using the kind of resistance exercise equipment that that we might be familiar with is kind of p- terrifying for them. What is this equipment? It looks like a torture device. It doesn't look like somewhere I want to go and spend half an hour uh, sitting and exercising yeah. on. So can we try and bypass that by getting people to do stuff in the comfort of their own home? But then obviously the downside is they're not supervised. Will they go to the same intensity? Will they push themselves? Can we see the same effect? So we're at the very early mm. stages, very early stages of that. But it's definitely an area that uh, that we're hoping to pursue in more mm. depth. Uh, so it's more kind of pragmatic rather than necessarily a, a kind of physiological investigation. Uh, that one. Okay, let's get back to that in a moment and hear a few words from our sponsors. This podcast is sponsored by Fibian, a research device that has been shown to be valid in tracking sitting, standing, physical activity and energy expenditure. Furthermore, Fibian has been shown to be valid categorizing physical activity into light, moderate and vigorous intensity. In addition to scientific accuracy, Fibian provides automatically produced and easy-to-understand reports for research participants. Get scientific validation and learn more about Fibian at fibian.com slash research. Actually, in my my PhD, we were measuring EMG from older people when they were doing, like, climbing stairs. And, And we actually saw that with some individuals, climbing stairs was like supramaximal yeah. activation compared to the isometric. And actually for those who who it was really hard, they couldn't go five flights of stairs up, but they had to have a break. And it was never limited by the cardio respiratory function it was always limited from the neuromuscular side and it was quite interesting and it seemed that for especially for the weaker individuals climbing stairs was was a good strength training exercise and i remember seeing some people tried that they would do strength training with the ergometer that you just put the resistance as high as possible and then do a couple of revolutions so that could be what what kind of movements you have been planning for this so i mean exercises? as you say things like stair climbing can be m- more strenuous than a kind of leg press or leg extension type exercise for a lot of older mm. people and it is simple things like that we are looking at so actually even just for an older person getting it up and down from the chair with no weights mm. just doing squats doing 20 of them for a minute for a that for them is the equivalent of doing leg presses for 20 minutes. You'll still reach the same level of uh, activation of the muscle than you would during that. So we've got things like that you can do. Some are still able to do lunges. For the upper body, it's a bit more challenging, but we're not trying to reinvent the wheel, but just doing things like press-ups against the wall, moving down to on the mm. knees if they're capable, bringing in some resistance bands for certain exercises for the upper body. Uh, trying to basically keep it as simple as we can that people will be able mm. to do it but also yeah. uh, tra- still bearing in mind that it is important to stress the muscle enough and it's not because the tendency I guess with a lot of the resistance band stuff is people get the lightest resistance band and they do a few bicep curls and oh that's me I'm knackered and they they weren't they weren't stressing the muscle or activating yeah. it at all so it's trying to find a happy balance between I guess that's the age old problem with all exercises uh, it's finding that happy balance between uh, what people will do but making sure it's enough that they actually get the, the health benefits of that uh, yeah yeah. and how, how do you see for sarcopenia do you think it's more important to actually activate the biggest type 2B motor units or do you see that you should create like a metabolic cost for the muscle that if you do, for example, you said like 20 squats, that's probably demanding for the muscle. But I don't know if you, you, you will actually recruit the biggest motor units. Yeah. So what we are doing is we're kind of and we've done some work on this along with lots of other people. Uh, 
going down the route of when we kind of ask people to do these exercises we ask them to do each one to the point or near to the point of failure so kind of mm. on the premise that that we will then reach the activation of the larger motor units because I'm, I'm sure you're aware of the research that a lot of it's come out now showing that yeah you don't necessarily need heavy weights to fully recruit all the the kind of your larger motor units you can get the same hypertrophic response same activation if you do a lighter weight but you just end up doing more of them so that's why i'm saying about 20 repetitions it, it might be 10 for some people maybe 22 mm. we're asking people to go to adjust the exercise so it's hard enough that they kind of get to failure within a reasonable length of time which also for us makes it a lot easier to explain to the to the person mm. that actually just go to your kind of knackered is what we, we we would say to people and it doesn't yeah. it doesn't matter if it's 10 it doesn't matter if it's 15 we don't want it to be 120 because that's just not going to be feasible uh yeah but something that's achievable and simple for them to remember they don't have to worry about the guys in the gym that have got their wee notebooks and on bench press i do two reps yeah. at 92 kilograms i do three reps that from a general population point of view that's never going to work people are not going to remember all that i can never remember that myself going to the gym uh i don't can't expect everyone to to remember these things yeah so. yeah makes makes sense so yeah I, I was thinking just like how how is it like you could also activate maybe with the fast movements the type 2b but but then also it's for people who haven't done sports yeah. or are not used to it, it's just difficult them to activate maximally, activate muscles fast. So it's yeah. it is it is a challenge. Yeah, but it is something that so some of the because one thing before I moved into older people research, I completely underestimated the robustness of people over the age 65 at that point i was i don't know 24 25 i thought being mm. six, 65 was oh you were ancient at 65 <laughs> some of the people we get in the lab that are 65 they're not necessarily representative of the whole population some of them are very very fit people some of them are fitter than me uh, and for some of them it can be hard to to with just a normal squat without any weights for them to to actually exercise the muscle enough so people that are capable we have used things like adding in a jump to the squat and these kind of things that people that are capable of the more explosive type fast movements that you mentioned then we have brought them in uh, and then they can still get to fatigue activate all the motor units within a reasonable length of time because for some of these people that are very fit if you just mm -hmm. ask them to stand up and down they would be able to do that kind of for a very long period of time and never never yeah. get never get to the point of fatigue. So where 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 it's possible and people are capable we have kind of m m added in those movements uh, that people can do. Yeah, yeah. And how how do you see like for example the masters athletes if you take somebody throwing a javelin they are in a in a really good good fitness. Do they actually prove that sarcopenia is more like it's not about aging but kind of time being sedentary or being not active that you just the time is is longer when you get older or do you think that they are like just more talented or or some some other difference yeah so that's a really interesting question i think I, i'm seeing a lot more papers on master athletes coming out and being published and a lot of the time people refer to them in the papers as a, a model of healthy aging and a model of being physically active through the life course i kind of i think we're often quite guilty as researchers of going for one or the other like kind of as you said mm -hmm. there are is that does that kind of show that that's what if you're physically active through your lifestyle that's what you'll look like or does it show that they're just talented people there's a continuum, obviously, of these things. It's probably a mix of two, but I probably end up, I personally go for the latter, in that if you, there's a difference between physically active, being physically active through your lifetime, and being an, mm. an elite trained master athlete who are doing a lot of training. Yes, it's 
exceedingly impressive that these athletes can perform the way they do. Interestingly though, you would never expect even with the training a, an elite master athlete to be able to run a 9.59 second 100 meters. So there's clearly a mm. de- there's clearly a decline even in these people that are the elite of old age. They're never going to run two hours. The sub two hour marathon is not going to be broken by a 75 year old. Uh, if it's broken by anyone, it'll, yeah. it'll not be a, a 75 year old. So there yeah. clearly there clearly is even in the most active of older people there clearly is a decline with function but what I think the, for me the biggest flaw with looking at master athletes as a model of active aging is that just from personal experience from experience of working with people during exercise doing studies in older people there's a lot of older people and younger people middle aged people that want to be more active mm-hmm. that cannot be active for a variety of reasons and to me, the elite master athletes are, they probably have very unique genetics that allow them to keep active up to the age of mm-hmm. 75. They have managed to stay clear of serious injuries. They've managed to avoid things in their social, personal, family life that have stopped them exercising. They've managed to avoid metabolic disease. Surely some of these things might be because they've kept active, but they're they have got some inherent, whether it's fully genetic, whether it's environment as well, but there's something within there that has allowed them to stay active and be able to train up to the 75. I I know a lot of people that come into our lab that are 65, 70 that would love to be able to go and train at that level, mm-hmm. but for them it's just not physically possible. They've got rheumatoid arthritis, so that they can't do that with their joints. They've got They've had to have a hip replacement, so they're limiting that. They can still do stuff and they can still do activity, but they're never going to be competing at like these elite master athletes. So I tend to think of them as outliers rather than representative of a kind of healthy aging population. I still think it's a fascinating area of study to see actually what can these people do. But for me, the more interesting question I think with the master athletes is how can they still manage to do it? and understanding actually what is it about them that makes them able to to keep doing these things uh, hmm. yeah yeah I, I i can see that that's interesting and how, how is it i think i have read sometimes that the sarcopenia affects the distal muscles more that further it is from the from the body the muscle it it is stronger effect uh, have, have you seen this in your studies to be honest, we've not really looked at it. We've tended to, most of our studies, when we've looked at muscle mass, some of our studies we've done whole body MRIs and we've looked at whole body muscle mass, but most of the time, and as with most other studies, we've focused on the quadriceps muscles for mm. the kind of usual reasons. One, we're taking muscle biopsies and that's one of the easiest places to take muscle biopsies. Two, it's where everybody else studies. Three, people study it because it's one of the main muscle groups involved in lots of functional movements, getting out your chair, climbing up the stairs, these kind of things. A lot of it relies on the quadricep muscles. So we've never really looked at it. Uh, most of our studies have looked localized specifically to uh, to the kind of lower limb quadricep, uh, quadricep muscle, mm. muscle groups. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah, and and you said about this new study, six month study. You said that you will start to look look also the EMG and and did you mention that you also do stimulation or some some other things? Yeah, yeah. So we're gonna we're gonna do some uh, EMG, and we're also going to look at voluntary activation. So we're doing kind of uh, interpolated twitch technique. Uh, of yeah. the quadricep muscles as well just to get a bit of an idea of is there much of a neuromuscular effect of, of the krill oil there's a lot more we could do in these things but we've kind of because originally when we were talking about that study we wanted to also take some muscle biopsies and to try and look at measuring kind of isolated muscle fiber contractile properties and these kind of things which I think would be interesting to do because there's there's some evidence from animal studies that 
giving amiga 3 fatty acids it was cardiac muscle but it can increase the relative force production so the kind of mm. the the force the muscle can produce irrespective of size can can increase uh, with omega-3 fatty acids so there's some potential that it might actually be something inherent within the contractile properties of muscle that might be affected by the omega-3 fatty acids that that might well uh, might well be affected so but we should we just ended up not going down that route because firstly we really wanted to confirm are we are we seeing a real effect so we wanted to do a bigger study to actually see in the in a big population does the omega-3 fatty acids actually still have the effect we've seen them in the very controlled small studies but can we still see it in the in the bigger study so we kind of had to drop some of the more invasive technical measurements because it just yeah. it would inhibit recruitment and it makes it just too much for the uh, for the size of the study so we've kind of tried to to balance it out a little bit yeah and and just about the voluntary activation of the twits do you plan to stimulate the nerve or we started looking at doing it by the nerve but the the student that was doing it was, was struggling to to do it and he was to be honest a lot of it was kind of the the discomfort of getting around the femoral nerve area in an older person he was finding it and the, some of the older people were finding it a little bit uncomfortable so we've it's, it's surface uh, surface electrodes we're, we're just putting on yeah. to, to, to yeah. stimulate yeah. Uh, so it's more just that it was more a practical reason rather than a methodological reason that we, we've opted for that uh, yeah that, that that's why I actually asked because I was in one study doing the femoral nerve stimulation yeah. and for uh, when the person was relaxing the quadriceps, the nerve was quite easy to find. But then when the person is doing the maximal contraction, even if you kept the electrode in the same place, the shape of the leg changes yeah. and it's it's really challenging to find the nerve. And basically most of the time we didn't actually hit the nerve and the results were not, not yes. good. So, so you, yeah. can, you can actually use the results anyway because they weren't, they weren't, they weren't any good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a challenge. Yeah. And so so basically in your in your study with the omega three fatty acids, with women you saw that the strength was increasing but not the muscle mass, right? Yeah, so we saw what we would say is an increase in muscle quality. Uh yeah. the kind of force production per unit area was improved, yeah. Yeah. Because I I hadn't another episode with the with the researcher who was studying children and learning and then also fatty acids ah. and he found that even with children who don't have any deficiencies the fatty acids improved learning brain function cognition i don't yeah. remember which was the exact one i'm i'm just wondering could it be the same effect that that it it improves your brain function somehow which is then probably the activation from the motor cortex towards the muscle yeah so that's kind of partially yeah so there's quite a lot of research from a kind of brain memory learning point of view that we know that dha one of the fatty acids incorporates into the uh, into the nerve membrane and can improve conduction velocity along the nerve so that does there's some evidence in older people but also in athletic populations that high DHA supplements can improve neural function uh, through that mechanism. So that's kind of partially our thinking that actually it could well be it could be more of a neural thing that yeah the DHA is incorporated in more DHA is being in the kind of nerve improving the conduction velocity signals getting to the muscle quicker stronger resulting mm. in a big uh, resulting in a bigger contraction but the muscles not got any bigger uh, so that's kind of one of the the ways we are thinking because our very original hypothesis was that there's a lot of research from the kind of immunology world that the omega-3 fatty acids are so-called anti-inflammatory and they reduce inflammation and we know in older people older people tend to have this chronic low-grade inflammation that is thought mm. to it's thought to possibly inhibit the 
kind of protein metabolism to so, so the muscle protein synthesis and and block that and that was kind of originally what we thought we thought we'll give some people some fish oil we'll dampen their inflammation we'll increase protein synthesis and muscle will get bigger and they'll get stronger but we found we measured some inflammatory markers as well in quite a few of our studies in our animal study and our human studies and we've never seen any effect on the inflammatory markers mm-hmm. uh, and we'd our studies haven't seen any effect in the protein synthesis although others have found effects in protein synthesis uh, but even in the ones that have found effects in protein synthesis there's been no anti-inflammatory effect of these omega-3 fatty acids in the older people so mechanistically it's it's it's, it's quite challenging to understand what what is going on mm. really uh, to be honest yeah and I, I'm thinking that if I if I've read that with older women uh have eating more non-saturated fats or the relations between non-saturated fats and saturated fats improve their had like positive hormonal effects which affected their uh, strength gains in uh, strength training intervention do you think this could be uh, have you read anything I've, i don't know that, that study uh, study you're referring to no No, I'm afraid All right. Not. Yeah. And uh, ha- have you looked at the the relation between non-saturated and saturated fat in your studies? Oh. We've not from a cuz if you're looking at saturated unsaturated fats cuz in our intervention all we've done is change the kind of omega-3 fatty acid intake. We've not really made any substantial change to saturated unsaturated uh Often people would look at the omega three, omega six mm. ratio, uh, and fat, and obviously we've changed that. But in our studies, no. I would imagine to really look at that out with that, it would probably be some of the epidemiological data. But I don't remember seeing any epidemiological data that shows that the kind of ratio of saturated to unsaturated really has any massive association with with muscle but then you've obviously seen this intervention study so I'll, I'll need to look it up and see let's hear a few words from our sponsors and get back to that right after this podcast is sponsored by Fibian a research device that has been shown to be valid in tracking sitting standing physical activity and energy expenditure get scientific validation and learn more about Fibian at fibian.com/research And how how do you see like now you had the difference between men and women, but it seems that it was it was more about about muscle, not not through the hormone. Do you think that the hormonal system differences make a difference in the older adults, or how 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 does it go? So in, in our study, the the kind of sex difference that we saw first, I'd quite like to confirm that in a bigger study again, but assuming it is true. Uh, and to be honest, I don't really know why it happened, but our main thought is that when we looked at the just the responses to exercise, say in the control group, what we found was that the women in general responded less well than the men. So, say I can't remember the exact numbers off the top of my head, but on average, say the the women increased their muscle strength by fifteen twenty percent with eighteen mm. weeks of resistance training, whereas the guys increased theirs by 25-30% so we're thinking that it might just simply be that the men were closer to kind of maximizing the potential gains that they could actually see whereas the women had more of a kind of attenuation in their in their response to exercise so there was more room for improvement basically so by giving the omega 3s to both of them there wasn't really much that could be improved in the men But in the mm. women, there was more room for improvement, so that's why we saw the improvement there. And it, we thought it, thought it might it might be a bit of a generational thing as well, and that the older in our study anyway, the older guys we had in our study they they weren't exercising a lot at the time, but throughout their life they in general had been quite fit people. They'd done a lot of exercise mm. training, played a bit of sport, ran some ten k's quite regularly. Yeah. Whereas a lot of the women were 
I had never done really any exercise at all. They were from more of a generation where they were maybe look at home looking after the kids, cooking the dinner type thing, which uh, mm. obviously has changed now. But but back then that was kind of more commonplace. So the men we think maybe just more of a kind of if you, if you believe the data holds true, a muscle memory type response. They were used to the training, so they they uh, they kind of got a more maximal response to training. Whereas in the the women, it was all quite new to them, and they didn't didn't get as much of a response. So the omega threes could could improve in in them. That's an hypothesis. To be honest, mm-hmm. out with out with it kind of sounds sensible. We don't have a lot of we don't have any data to actually support that. So it's it's kind of something that we need to try and look yeah. in, look into yeah. a little bit more. Yeah, that's that's interesting. So one thing could be that if the men have used to do sports more, they can actually activate better and the training would be more effective. Yeah. But also in the same vein, it would be that actually then if women haven't trained as much, they could have a bigger window of improvement. Yeah, because yeah, they were starting from a lower baseline, you could... Yeah. yeah, you could see much more. Usually with strength training, you see a big big yeah, effects yeah. even in one one training session so it's it's quite but quite interesting that, how our, our I our thinking do. was that although they, they were active in kind of their midlife in the last 10 years or so when we had them in the lab they hadn't been active so they'd all kind of gone back down to the kind of baseline mm. low level but once they started training the kind of muscle memory activation in the men kicked in from midlife but as I said it's very hypothetical uh, so it could well be completely wrong yeah <laughs> I'll put my hands up and say that here that it could well be wrong definitely yeah but that's that's the point of research we don't know exactly. yet what will be the thing because it's if always you, retros- it would be, it'd be boring wouldn't it yeah and always retrospectively people are like why do we need to study that it's yeah. clear like yeah, exactly you go to the gym and or the if, muscle or, mass increases yeah yeah or if you do find something different from not what you expected like oh, you go, oh well actually that was obvious we shouldn't have thought we were going to see that yes yeah, it's, it's obvious now but at the time we made that hypothesis on the basis of the available evidence so yeah it's makes it interesting doesn't it yeah that's that's fully true yeah, it's been it's been very interesting things. I think I don't have any anything to ask anymore about sarcopenia. Is there something yeah. something on your mind that you would like to discuss? Uh, I could tell you a bit about the kind of other area that we work on that's probably not on my online profile and we've not really published much of it yet. Is again, it's kind of related to sarcopenia and the loss of muscle, but it's uh, it's research looking in South Asian people, and yep. we we look in South Asian people because they're about around about four times more likely to get diabetes than a kind of white European counterpart. Hmm. They're more likely to get diabetes at a lower BMI, uh, so a BMI of twenty three is roughly equivalent to a BMI of twenty nine thirty in a white European. They progress more quickly through diabetes and have often get higher complications as well. There's lots of potential reasons for this, uh, which I'll not go into in in any great detail, but one of the things we think may contribute is that people from South Asia, so we're talking India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, these kind of Sri Lanka, these kind of places, is that they also have lower muscle mass as well. Mm -hmm. So we know muscle mass is important for metabolic health we know that it's the biggest site for glucose disposal if you kind of take on carbohydrates 80 percent of it will go to go into muscle so if you've got a bigger muscle more of it will get taken out you'll kind of maintain glucose control better so we've kind of just started some studies trying to actually understand why the south asians have lower muscle mass than white european people uh, so we've kind of just done a study which we're kind of writing up just now looking at, the first thing we looked at again was we used the uh, deuterium oxide traces we measured free living, free living muscle protein synthesis in mm. South Asians and white Europeans thinking we would see a difference 
we didn't see a difference. That yeah. was it. Uh, so that was interesting. Uh, next, because our, our kind of thinking was that what drives muscle size, activity is one of the main drivers. So we obviously can't look at lifelong activity in muscle and population. That's not feasible. So what we did was we then stimulated muscle through a resistance exercise training in South Asians mm. and white Europeans thinking that we might see a reduced response in the South Asians kind of indicating similar to older people possibly an anabolic resistance to to the kind of exercise training that they were doing but interestingly looking at the results early uh, kind of just preliminary they've just kind of got in the last few months uh, it's not what we see at all. So not only is protein synthesis similar between South Asians and white Europeans, but also we see hypertrophy responses similar to white Europeans. So we see robust gains in muscle mass, gains in muscle strength to the same extent as we see in white Europeans. <coughs> what is interesting, and it's something we need to probe a little bit more deeply, is we also looked at insulin sensitivity through a mixed meal tolerance test so we gave people a bagel and some milk and some butter and some crisps and looked at the insulin and glucose responses five hours after and while we saw an improvement in that in white Europeans which is what we would expect with uh, muscle strengthening exercises we didn't see any improvement in the in the South Asians <coughs> unfortunately the study wasn't fully powered to look at that so Statistically, there's not a difference, but when you difference, but when you see it visually, it's quite clear there's an improvement in white Europeans and, and not in South Asians. Uh, there's nothing going on at all. So it kind of seems to be that their muscles have got bigger as a mm. white European, but whereas for a white European that's translated to improvements in insulin sensitivity, that's not happened in the in the South Asian population. We also took some muscle biopsies and we did some kind of transcriptomic analysis mm. uh, in the muscle biopsies before and after training, which is maybe not the perfect timing because there's a lot of evidence that actually the acute transcriptomic response might be more more useful looking at these mechanistically, but it was the biopsies we had. And there, again, there's some indication that some of the metabolic pathways that change with exercise training and white Europeans aren't changing in the South Asians. I still, right. need to, I still need to process it more fully so I can't talk more about exactly what they are. So uh, there's again not what we expected but from that study there's some there's some very interesting data kind of coming out and leading to more questions than answers but again that's yeah. what that, that's what research is research is about so again it's another population where we're trying to understand why is mm. muscle mass low how can we increase it and uh, what are the consequences of it yeah and and you said that they they get the diabetes with lower body mass index yeah and then the muscle mass is lower so basically if muscle mass is lower the fat percentage has to be higher right yeah 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 so do you think it's more about the muscle mass or actually the fat percentage which i think is in relation to insulin resistance then yeah so again that's i've got some colleagues here that that i've done another study looking more at the fat side of things because it you're right it could well be uh it could well be the fat side of things and there's there was some evidence before and they've tried to investigate this i'll, I'll not talk about what they found uh, that's not for me to talk about but there was a hypothesis that in south asians that they didn't have as as good capacity to store adipose to store fat so when they gained weight whereas in a white european we could store it relatively safely in our adipose tissue depots subcutaneously mm -hmm. There, there was a thinking that it spilled over in South Asians because they couldn't store it safely and it ended up in the liver, it ended up in the pancreas, it ended up in the muscle. It was being stored more ectopically. Uh, mm. and, and there's, so there's some thought that that's maybe what's driving. As with everything, it's probably likely to be, I'm, I'm definitely not saying it's going to just be muscle mass. Uh, that may be one of the contributing factors. Mm. Uh, there's, there's more. There's definitely a lot of evidence that there's adipose tissue having a role as well in the in driving the higher diabetes risk for sure. There's some possibly some epigenetic as well. 
data, there's there's some evidence that the beta cell function, uh, particularly as diabetes progresses, not as good in in South Asians compared to white Europeans. There's a kind mm -hmm. of there's some evidence even that South Asians tend to be smaller babies, and there's some kind of fetal programming going on as well that is driving it in later life so there's a lot of factors that are likely contributing in, in one fashion or another we just in this study were looking at the the muscle but interestingly what we also did find was that whereas South Asians gained muscle the white Europeans lost a little bit of fat because uh, we did in this study we did whole body MRIs they lost a little bit of fat but the South Asians didn't really lose fat and if anything their fat kind of creeped up a little bit over the intervention so actually some of the effects we see in insulin sensitivity might be driven by the lack of change in fat with exercise. Mm. Uh, yeah. What's driving that? I've got no idea because we didn't think that would happen uh, and I said this to somebody else that we focused on muscle, took muscle biopsies and did all this maybe in retrospect we should have collected some fat biopsies as well and looked in, in fat because there's maybe something interesting going on there. So again, further work we need to we need to go and look at that as well. Yeah, no, that's that's very interesting. We were actually doing a study in China with university student, and we were looking the non-weight obesity that you have a normal BMI, but yeah. the fat person it's over. So it was, I think, from young university students, there was like I think twenty-five percent of women were non-weight obese. Yeah already around age of 20 and then there was quite a big maybe another 25 percent who were close and probably in some years probably with the same lifestyle getting actually non-weight obese and then we found that their performance in almost everything was much lower yeah. probably probably due to low low muscle mass but it was quite a quite an alarming finding that how how prevalent the non-weight obesity seemed to be yeah, that is quite. Students. Those numbers are quite, quite surprising because we know BMI has its flaws. We know it's not a perfect measure of obesity, but it hangs around because clinically it's it's something that can be measured easily. But yeah, when you're saying there that the prevalence of uh, obesity in normal BMI was that high, that's quite surprising. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I think it's. Uh important thing to study especially with the, with the with the asian countries that the diabetes is really going going up yeah but yeah i think i think for the lower muscle mass there might be genetic differences but i think also like just just kind of the culture of training especially women usually don't do sports that much in in many of the countries and yeah. then i think in india it's quite a lot of vegetarian yeah naturally so i think the protein intake might be lower or it's a different quality of protein so yeah there is definitely because what i should have said was our study they were all they were all uk based south asians ah, so all right yeah i should have said that at the start so yeah they were most of them were f probably first or second generation uh immigrants to to, the, to Scotland, so yeah. th when when we measured their protein intake and their physical activity habits, they were exactly the same as the white European people. But mm. when it comes to for the when a worldwide diabetes prevalence, which a lot of is being driven by high prevalence rates in India and Pakistan, and actually in the South Asian countries, I think you're definitely right. There is there's definitely more of a malnutrition problem. There there is definitely more. Uh, low protein diets that are driving things there's less physical activity there's more mm -hmm. of a big split within the the population as you mentioned so what would be quite interesting what I'd, we'd quite like to do as well is actually look at getting a study where it's uk based or immigrant whether it's uk whether it's america whether it's anywhere in europe south asians white europeans but then also do something similar with a cohort in South Asia as well, in India, in Pakistan, and compare mm. the compare the three groups and actually see where, because uh, in many ways the South Asian immigrants to the UK have became more like your kind of indigenous white European population uh, yeah. over over time, but in many ways they're different. So would they fall in the middle compared to the 
uh, people still residing in South Asia and the white Europeans or where would they fall in that? I think it'd be quite fascinating to actually see to see that as well. Yeah, yeah, I fully, fully agree. Yeah, sounds like very important lines of study with the sarcopenia and, and then the diabetes yeah. axis with the South Asian. Yeah. Anything else you do in your, your lab or? Uh, we do, yeah, we, we do lots, we do lots of other things as well, <laughs> yeah. yeah, but I don't know, we've got some, we've got some other studies looking at uh, diet and weight loss and combining that with resistance exercise and diabetic populations. We've started some work recently with uh, people in Kuwait where diabetes and obesity is a big issue, trying to develop exercise and lifestyle interventions around uh, around diabetes prevention mm. and rem and remission of diabetes as well hopefully but if we we'd need to talk for another hour or two if i start to get yeah. to them so uh, yeah. we can leave them for another another time uh, yeah we can we can have another session i think we uh, almost almost hour now yeah yeah thanks it's it's been really interesting discussions and i have actually learned a lot at the same time and looks like very important work so hopefully you will figure out these these questions you are yeah you're you looking to answer fingers crossed i get some answers at some point soon yeah all right thanks thanks to it for being a guest no problem thanks for having me good to talk to you this podcast is sponsored by fibian get scientific validation and learn more about fibian at fibian.com slash research the Physical Activity Researcher podcast has created an activity tracker purchase guide for researchers. Get your free copy from the link in the podcast description. Thank you for listening to the Physical Activity Researcher podcast.